Okay, people are coming. We are 20 now. Okay, I'm going to start. Um, so my name is Yahya Ithawi. I am a, a pediatrician and neonatologist. And this is uh, one of the series of talks that I'm going to give. And uh, we gave uh, three before, and this is the fourth one. And uh, the topic is selected according to the importance and uh, according to the consensus from uh, the participants. So today's talk is about initial care of sick newborn. So please, if I'm going fast or slow, or you don't hear, or you have a question, you either to chat or raise your hand because I muted everybody and nobody can talk uh, as somebody is uh, having some background voice. Um, so all of you know this uh, because I was communicating the whole day about it. Um, so uh, the, objective, uh, the objectives of this talk is to define what is initial care and then to define the components of the initial care and I will talk about uh, some resources and then overview and how the um, initial gear should go and uh, uh, how the um, organization on the flow of this uh, uh, practice. So um, there is something called golden hour and it's the first hour postnatal life in both preterm and term nanis. And uh, it depends on the using the best evidence to practice in term and preterm to uh, get the best result and to prevent complications. It's actually started in adult uh, patients after trauma because they discover after the first insult, there will be secondary and tertiary insult due to um, improper management. Um, the evidence of benefit of golden hour practice is very well uh, uh, supported by evidence in Britain babies. However, there is no evidence in term babies. Despite that, there is a global acceptance from all neonatologists to practice golden hour in both term and Britain babies. Now, the initial care uh, of sick newborn composed of um, uh, Uh, neonatal resuscitation and then post resuscitation and how to transport the baby to an ICU, how to do respiratory support, how to do cardio, uh, cardiovascular support and how to stabilize the baby at the uh, uh, arrival to the nursery. Um, there is a clear evidence as we said about using golden hour practice in neonates in preterms, and there is marked reduction when people start to do this procedure, uh, especially uh, controlling uh, hypothermia, the incidence of hypothermia, also preventing and treating hypoglycemia. Um, it has led to uh, a reduction in IVH and in PBD and in ROP. And there is something also called gentle care that now we, in addition to golden hour. Gentle care means do less harm and give the best benefit uh, and do the least invasive possible. Also gentle care composed of early feeding, whether you are giving EPM as express breast milk or you have, your facility has a DPM. I know like donor breast milk is uh, donor breast milk is um, something religiously maybe unacceptable in Middle East, but the evidence that donor breast milk um, show great improvement in both nutrition, uh, days of stay in the hospital, incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis. However, um, early feeding is important, whether EPM or DPM, and also aggressive uh, TPM. And that's why uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, sorry, I I am just receiving a call, um, and so that's why we have um, 
uh, so early feeding, as we talked, sorry, I, I, sorry for interruption. I'm, I'm being interrupted by some people. Uh, so early feeding is very important um, uh, because um, uh, the evidence are very strong, whether it's EPM or DBM, also aggressive TPN. And aggressive TPN mean in start as early as possible and give a good amount. And therefore, because this aggressive, we have three types of, of TPN. The starter TPN, which is the ready-made TPN, which is um, composed of water, sugar, and protein. No electrolytes, no lipid. And then there's other types, which is not the purpose of this talk, is the prescribed and the starter TPN. But uh, the aggressive mean TPN start as early as possible within one hour of life if you have line, and it should be a starter TPN. Avoid unnecessary uh, lines as part of gentle care. Um, avoid unnecessary intubation, avoid unnecessary tests or x-rays, avoid frequent nursing. So we have, for example, um, in our uh, facility, no weight in the first three days. And we keep the baby in midline position. We control noise. So we have noise detector. We control light and cover the baby because these babies are human beings and need to sleep. We involve family and you have different ways to involve family like fire care or kangaroo care. Uh, we do a very diligent uh, to pr protect the position of the baby. We do nesting and we do lots of uh, neurodevelopmental care. So these are all called gentle care. So initial care involve um, support, transport, uh, arrival to an ICU, uh, golden hour and gentle care. Now, this is a picture of the uh, our resource room and you can see we have two beds and they are fully equipped, although they called the uh, they are called the resource room, but they can see they are fully equipped with ventilators. We have high frequency jet, we have conventional monitors, cameras, uh, monitoring, uh, so people can monitor and no need for, for more than one uh, healthcare provider to rub around the baby. And you can, you, you can see it's very well equipped. It is um, as if it's um, uh, uh, um, actual an ICU. Uh, so, um, before we start the initial care, now we should have, um, we anticipate. So by anticipating, we know what our um, capability and we know what our limitation. So we need to have a setting, we need to have uh, uh, resources, uh, whether tools or personnel, we need to do training and we need to, to have an expectation because uh, if you are second level and ICO, you cannot go down to 23 weeker. So, because if you don't have expectation, you will be wasting your resources. And then also anticipation of uh, uh, resuscitation depend on location. So you cannot allow a birth, or well, sometimes it happens, but you cannot allow uh, a birth in a remote area of, of 24 weeker. Now, also part of the uh, initial care is the uh, um, instrument. So I'm not going to go through all this uh, list, but actually we have a suction equipment, we have intubation equipment, we need medications, and we have uh, some miscellaneous uh, equipment, and you need always additional equipment for very, very small babies. Uh, for the training, all the people involved, all the healthcare providers, should have um, certified with an RP. And this, um, as um, most or all of you know, that an RP is uh, valid for two years and need to be uh, recertified. Uh, for babies less than 28 weeks, there should be two skilled physician, confident. Um, although I've written no resident, no trainee, but sometime if you are well-trained and if you are in level four and level three of your training, then you can attend these deliveries. We usually have two nurses, uh, resource nurses, and we have one respiratory therapist. Now, if you don't have respiratory therapist, you can have three nurses. Now, one nurse for documentation, one nurse for assistance, and the other one can take care of the uh, uh, respiratory supporting device devices. It's also very good when you anticipate delivery to have a list of high-risk deliveries. These risks are related to maternal conditions and problems and also fetal conditions and problems. 
And uh, also, you should have idea of, of anticipated antipartum complications and, you know, ideas of and list of uh, delivery complications. And also, you should have a, a procedure to uh, tackle the uh, unexpected delivery. So you should have, for example, neonatal code blue. And then from this list, you decide whether to attend or not to attend. And when you don't attend, then what you will do if an emergency happens. By setting, so before we talked about uh, resources with tools, and now we have settings. So it's vital to have independent resuscitation room. You cannot resuscitate inside an ICU. So you should have independent isolated resuscitation room. This room should be linked to the delivery rooms or operation where C-section is, is going. And it's best to be linked to an ICU somewhere. You should have a, a uh, a neutral thermal condition, so we are should able to control the temperature and the flow, and should be very well equipped. Now, this is a picture from our NICU, and you can see this baby has a conventional ventilation, the N, uh, V, uh, or the VN uh, 500, the dragger, uh, high frequency jet, um, giraffe incubator, uh, multiple infusion bumps, uh, monitors. Um, and, 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 and other equipment, chairs, and so it's very well, uh, uh, very well equipped. This is another picture of our NICU. You can see it's very well equipped. You have all everything you need. Uh, this is the other side. You can see the shelves, the content, and all the guidelines are, are hanged. Um, you can see we have a door to the NICU. We have the resuscitation bag that we can take. You can see the request, the uh, requisitions forms. You can see towels and gowns, and then you can see also the um, the sink and um, um, different types of pins for disposable and for the waste. You can see that we have uh, um, this is another view. You can see it's very well equipped and actually heavily equipped. Uh, you can see the shelf that it's also very well equipped and all the guidelines in. and this is the third bed. Our room has three beds. And this is the picture of the third bed and you can see we have monitor conventional, we have, we have uh, x-ray station and you can see are all ready and prepared. Um, you can see we have very clear access door. You can see the camera, communication phones. Okay, I have chat from somebody. Oh, sorry, I can slow down. Yeah, sure. So I'm just trying to describe the uh, uh, resuscitation room that we have. Um, it's a, it is um, a very well equipped. I'm trying to give you an example of the initial care that we take. Uh, this is our uh, x-ray machine, the portable. These are the extra supplies. Uh, you can see it's all labeled with the name and the expiry date. And they are outside the NICU because they, there is no room. You can see we have very well equipped transport uh, machine. You can see it's motorized, so it's less heavy. You can see it has um, a conventional ventilation, high frequency ventilation, um, inhaled nitric oxide, monitors and infusion pumps. You can see bags for, you can see uh, oxygen. So actually we can, we have a, a, a portable an ICU. Um, we should have, we're, and we should be talking about pre-terms equipment, extra equipment like polyethylene bags, which is a, a, a plastic bag that uh, uh, prevent uh, skin evaporation and, and, and dehydration. Uh, we have very skilled personnel for intubation, so not anybody can intubate, only the experienced person can intubate babies on 23, 24, 25, up to 26. Um, there should be surfactant always available. We should have know how to take skin care, whether uh, the, the kind of, 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 of adhesives or uh, how we uh, handle the baby or what type of chemical we use. We should have a small line size to use in, small hats and small diapers. Uh, we talked about resources. So we have very um, uh, solid training program to train new nurses. And um, what are the challenges of the initial care in the preterm babies? The main challenges is controlling the, uh, the, uh, the temperature, the hypothermia, uh, com controlling the uh, sugar, um, ventilation, and making a, a breathing IV access infection, and preventing organ damage, 
like eye, brain, lung, capillaries, preventing acute complication like pneumothorax, fluid, TM, also um, making sure um, the uh, required fluid, TPN, and feeding. And we have something called antenatal consult. This consult um, uh, showed the, uh, the uh, limit of viability for the parent, uh, what will be the expected course, and what will be the length of the stay, what's the expected mortality and morbidity, what's the complication. We take consents from parent during this antenatal consult. Uh, we show them the, our competency, we offer them a tour and we connect them with a support group. So what we do is uh, we receive um, a requisition. This is our requisition for antenatal uh, care plan. And it's the first part filled by the obstetrician and the second part filled by us. And then we tick whatever we talked with the parent about. So it's the survival, the length of the stay, uh, the expected complications, and the consent for blood, consent for uh, donor milk, and then with sign. And this is valid only for one week. So um, if baby, let's say we see the baby at 24 plus one, then you should have another one at 25 plus one. As you know, the, the expected course um, totally change with uh, advancing gestation and advancing weight. When we do the consult also, we handle the parent a sheet. This tell them what they are expecting, what the uh, complications and how we can communicate with us. So you can see our survival rate depending on the weight at 23 uh, weeks, uh, what our uh, uh, survival rate and 24 is 60%, a lot of improvement, 25 up to 80%. And you can see when we reach uh, the 28, it's close to term baby. And then also the, um, um, uh, expected morbidity rate. And also um, some talk with the, to them, some, some data and some information about uh, what will happen and what the complication expected. And of course, this cannot be like, not a must to be in English, can be in Arabic or in French or, or, or Kurdish or any language. And this is the bag of there. And it's also telling them more information, how they can communicate with our, when they uh, uh, can um, call and who to contact when they need help and um, what the support they have. Uh, also, you should have, um, I'm not starting yet the initial care, but also to start initial care, you need um, a lot of support, cardiologist, pediatric surgeon, neurosurgeon, um, ID team, nephrologist, urologist, hematologist, genetician, neurologist and radiologist. Um, other discipline like uh, occupational therapist, physiotherapist, dietitian, social worker, pharmacist, uh, feeding group, uh, skin uh, care group, and vascular access team. Um, and then we should have a very good antenatal management, especially intrapartum antibiotics, antenatal steroid, magnesium sulfate. And also we have a list of, of, of uh, what type of C-section we do, whether it's a cold or semi-cold or emergency or agency or crushed. Now, this is the differentiation of this is um, um, the length of when we expect the delivery, but also what is the complication expected. And also in antenatal management, we have the ultrasound and echo and fetal medicine. Um, before we do uh, initial care, we do a meeting, we do briefing, we talk about golden hour, we talked about gentle care, and then when we finish the uh, initial care, we do debriefing, um, and also we should assign team who's the leader, who's taking care of the, um, the uh, for example, the uh, uh, respiratory care, who's doing the communications, who's doing the uh, documentations, and we um, give very clear orders, and always there is respect. And this is our um, uh, very small uh, uh, babies, uh, 24, 26, 27, uh, up to 27 care, whether, it, um, so we have a list and then it's filled by the nurses and by respiratory therapists and by physician. And you can see the yellow one is for the very small babies. So this one is a pre-delivery checklist, but sometime when it's immediate, we have a shorter checklist. 
And then every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes, we felt it again. And then we do debriefing after. And then when we trans the baby also, we do a checklist. Now we start now with the initial care. So as most of you know, the initial care is, um, we start with the NRP uh, questions. Is the baby full term? Is there a good muscle tone, breathing or crying? So the answer either is no, then you have to initiate an RP, or the answer is yes, and then you'll do the uh, well baby care, delay cord clamping, need an examination, vaccination, maybe circumcision, neonatal screening, and establish feed with mom. Now, if the answer is no, then you initiate an RP. And after you initiate an RP, um, then you assess the response to the initial step of, of resuscitation, which is uh, what happened to the baby. Is the baby responding to the initial step? Then if it's yes, then we go what we call it monitoring care. Which is, um, same of uh, the uh, uh, previous well baby care, but in addition, we do vital sign check. And vital sign depend on severity, we do it Q2 to 4H. And vital sign, we mean respiratory rate, heart rate, uh, blood pressure, and extra. But also in, in monitoring care, we do sugar level, we may do gas, we may do sepsis workup. Now, if the baby does not, does not respond to the first step of resuscitation, he's going to the initial, uh, to intensive care. Um, and then after the initial, we do the further uh, resuscitation care. And this care depends on the status of the baby. So does the baby has apnea or if the baby gasping and the heart rate less than 100, then it will take, to, uh, will take you to a track uh, where you may give CPAP or you may give PPV or if the baby may have um, a labored breathing and persists the cyanosis, but his heart rate more than 100, it takes you to another bath or the baby heart rate less than 60, and that's another bath. And from then, uh, when you do further resuscitation, you should have a clear guideline of when to start sugar, when to start CPAP, when to start caffeine, timing of the line, and when and how to give surfactant. It's vital to have a standard care and a standard order. So you don't need to write everything and maybe you forget. So this is our, of course, anyone requested that I can provide it. I know it's a small letters, but it's what's saying here, it's uh, you have a list of orders. Some of them are already black color, which is must be done. And other, you need to take it off if you need to do it. And you can see, um, you have a date and time and wait, and then you can tick whatever. So the black one, it will be done by the nurses without order. That's an automatic order or a standard order. And then you have tick any order. And of course you have to fill. So it, it can remind you and also make your life easier when you order. Uh, this is another initial fluid order where you have to tell what's your total fluid order, what's your basic TBN. Of course you don't give uh, lipid. And also if you have arterial lines, um, um, and and um, you use, and if there is a difference of fluid, whether from the TPN, whether you use D10 or others. So it's a standard uh, fluid order sheet, and it helps you to remind you what to write, and also uh, it helps you to, uh, you know, uh, take less time of writing these orders. Now, this scale is very important, uh, and you can see it's, um, it's a one-hour scale, and start from birth and, and go on. And you can see in first two minutes, we do delay cord clamping. And also expected in first two minutes, you start CPAP. In first 10 minutes, you expected to do a peripheral IV and start dextrose. And in first 20 minutes, expected that caffeine hit the baby. You have about 45 minutes to do the central line and about two hours or one hour to do um, the sepsis workup. And usually the surfactant should be given um, after 30 minutes. Uh, the expected time for the x-ray is around 20 minutes. And remember, if there is an um, indication for a surfactant, the time to warm up the surfactant from fridge temperature to the room temperature takes about 20 minutes. You should not uh, throw it in any uh, uh, device. You should either use your hand or the light. It's very important to uh, control the temperature. Um, 
So you um, dry the baby, you may do skin to skin or use a plastic bag in a small babies. You can use warming pads or also remember if you have a time and you expected the delivery, you do pre-warming. Uh, very important to keep humidity of the room and the heated air. And uh, also um, always remember when you put your props of the uh, temperature to keep the skin of the baby as much as possible above 36. You should very important to prevent hyper and hypothermia. So the hypo hyperthermia and hypothermia effect is as severe as asphyxia. So it's very important to cut off the temperature. Now we will start with each part of the initial care a little bit in details. We'll start with uh, delay cord clamping. Now the evidence of delay cord clamping is very clear. Uh, it decreases the incidence of hypotension. It decreases the incidence of uh, anemia. It uh, increases the uh, mortality, uh, decreases the mortality and morbidity. And, uh, but also has a little bit of side effect with jaundice and maybe polycythemia. Uh, so what is the time? It can be one minute up to 10 minutes. And if you don't know, the practice of delay cord clamping started in Norway uh, uh, midwifery and where they, they were keeping the, uh, the uh, placenta connect, contact, uh, connected to the baby for until the placenta stopped beating up to 10 minutes. And from there, the practice was taken and, and then started to, draw, uh, to pass through uh, to the whole world. But the reasonable time would be like one to three minutes. But also remember that um, what happened in most of the practice, you give delay cord clamping to a stable baby, but when the baby is sick, we cut the cord. So we started something called placental transfusion during the resuscitation of sick baby. What does that mean? We keep the placenta attached and we start the resuscitation. So in C-section, the resuscitation kit is part of the C-section, uh, sterile C-section and we gown and go and resuscitate with the team and keep the baby attached to the mom. Well, when it's a vaginal, we don't need to do that because we have a movable table and tray that we can take it near the mom and do a resuscitation. Um, so, um, if you don't have uh, uh, these tools, now you have to decide when to stop. In our practice, we do two minutes uh, delay cord clamping. Now, CPAP, uh, very important, very important tools. When you start CPAP in initial care, you have to have timing. Our timing is two minutes. So, what we do is we turn the machine on prior delivery, we connect the uh, the operator, the generator of the nose uh, or the nasal prong uh, before the baby delivered. And when the baby is, we just need to put it on. So somebody put it on on the nose until others put the hat and connect and stabilize the air. So our target usually to start CPAP at two minutes. Also uh, very important when you start CPAP is you have suction tools, whether you use a catheter or you use Yangi. Um, and then for how long and what's the pressure you use and what's the frequency of your uh, suctioning. It's not preferred to do suctioning down to the stomach. When you manage the airway, you need to decide about the intubation. What's your indication, when to intubate and how. Um, and what is the procedure we're using? Uh, what type of uh, laryngoscopes or, or videoscope, whatever you're using? Uh, this is a uh, wrong spelling, but I meant RSI or rapid sequence intubation. So that's mean you give pre-medication before you intubate. So you need to decide in according to the unit, unit whether to give RSI or not. And then according to your facility and whether you can transport the baby on ventilator, you need to decide what type of ventilation. In our unit, we can give up to high frequency jet ventilation. I know jet ventilation is not available in Middle East. You have only high frequency oscillator. But you need to decide uh, to um, when to ventilate, how and what's your son, but, and, and how to ventilate, but that depends on your transport facility. You need to decide about your, how to give oxygen and how much and what's the percentage and when to do the gas. Um, again, one of the initial care is to give surfactant. So you should have, we have something called surfactant tool uh, and we give surfactant if the baby is premature and need FiO2 for more than 30% for 15 minutes or there is persistent need for CPAP more than eight centimeter water or there is increased work of breathing 
or there is a clear RDS um, evidence on X-ray, or uh, if your CO2 at delivery is more than 60. Uh, the timing, usually there's three types of time to give surfactant. There is uh, first 30 minutes, what we call it prophylactic, that we used to give. And then we call the other one we call early rescue, where we give it in the first uh, two hours, from 30 minutes to two hours, and then the late rescue. Now, there is no evidence for late, there is no evidence for prophylaxis. So here's your time to give surfactant between 30 minutes to two hours. When you give surfactant, I know you guys use Sorvanta, but we use Bless, but other use CuroServe, which is uh, porcine, and it is uh, only 1.25, so it's a kind of small volume. This is both our large volume. There is the InfoServe, and there is now the surfactant, uh, synthetic surfactant. And then when you give surfactant, you need to decide for how long you give it, like what is the duration? Uh, because if you give it fast, you will cause uh, mechanical obstruction. If you give it slow, you will cause some hypoxia. And what's the giving method you are using? Are you using um, um, invasive by intubation and giving or minimal invasive without intubation? When you intubate, are you using the open method, using uh, feeding tube or using the closed method? Uh, and and, and you, in, in a closed method, you use, use the multi-access uh, catheter. When you use a closed method and intubation, are you using single lumen or double lumen uh, ATT? And whether you will do hand ventilation or when you give, you will connect the baby to mechanical ventilation. Whether you should use x-ray before or not. And then how, when you intubate and you want to give surfactant, will you check for uh, the accuracy of uh, um, uh, tracheal catheterization, whether by your CO2 detectors or by X-ray, or what is your method? And you need to get, decide to give RSI or not, because if you want to give surfactant, then you might need to extubate the baby after surfactant. But when you give RSI, baby might not able to breathe for a while. So you need to decide whether to give rapid sequence intubation or medication pre-intubation or not. Now, this is uh, one of the closed method to give surfactant. Uh, and you can see that they are using two ports. And I hope the, the video will work. So you can see they are uh, bagging using hand ventilation. And they are injecting the surfactant from another port. This method, we do not prefer it. Uh, because um, when you do two lumen or double lumen catheter, that means your tube is, uh, uh, will be a bigger size. So when you do double port uh, ATT, if the baby uh, can, uh, or the size of the ATT for that baby is uh, uh, three, then with double lumen, you need to put 3.5. So it might have a more complication like, like later on, uh, such as focal cord paralysis, vocal trauma, uh, difficult for extubation or uh, uh, stenosis. What we use, what we call it multi-access catheter uh, or uh, MAC in short. And this one, if you can see, it's a catheter and it's sealed. So it's never connected to the outside, which means you will have less incidence of infection after giving the surfactant. And you can see the surfactant has uh, two ports. The catheter has two ports, uh, uh, one for ventilation and one for uh, giving uh, surfactant. So this one is connected here, and then you give the surfactant. And I'm going to show you how we give the surfactant. So this is a, what we call it closed method. And you can see I am intubating the baby. And it's a closed method, and you use multi-access catheter. So when you give surfactant and you extubate their baby right away, we call it insure or intubate, surfactant, and then extubate. And in this, it's either um, open method or, or double lumen, closed method, or uh, we use um, a closed method, but we use the multi-access catheter. So you can see that we intubate. and take the stylet outside, then change the adapters. We make sure, we, we like to use the flow inflation. We don't like to use the uh, self inflation. And then you can see we change the adapters, we cut it off and we put the uh, two port uh, catheter and then we connect the Mac catheter. 
because you can see the maracas that are sealed on site, so we'll not, and it's a disposable one. So and then um, the RT will start to uh, uh, thread the multi-axis catheter to inside the baby. It's a one tube. It's not multiple chest tube, and then inject surfactant and push it again. Uh, we like to give the surfactant in um, uh, two alicots, and each alicot we give it by about 10 seconds. Um, so, as we said, ensure it's either open method where you disconnect your uh, um, um, the, any bag that you are using, a PPV or the ventilator, and then you insert. Uh, your feeding tube and then inject the surfactant. The problem with that is you're losing the peep, so you will be de recruiting. Second, you are opening your tube to the uh, exterior, so there is a risk of infection. So that's, we never do it. And the open method, we do a closed method. We do not prefer the double lumen or two ports uh, surfactant giving because the diameter is bigger. We prefer to give in uh, MAC catheter or multi access catheter, and we give surfactant with uh, Ensure. Uh, we um, so intubate surfactant and extubate. We like to uh, uh, do not interrupt the giving peep during surfactant to prevent de recruitment. And in our facility, we use the five mil or the bless, and we extubate the baby right away. We do not wait for x ray, we do not wait for gas, because that means you will give more ventilation. And all of you, you know, the more ventilation means that. Um, more likely to cause some lung injury and damage. Now, the other way to give surfactant is a minimal invasive surfactant. And um, uh, 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 minimal invasive surfactant are of two types. The first type is catheterization of trachea. So you're actually not intubating, but you are putting something in the trachea to give the surfactant. So there are four types. There is the Cologne method, uh, which is from Germany, and there is take care method, which is from Turkey. And there is an optimist, uh, which is from Australia, from Tasmania, and it's our method. That's actually, it's my method. It's called Ecalmist, uh, which is early CPAP and uh, large uh, volume minimal invasive surfactant therapy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of them. Uh, in colon method, they use a little bit um, not soft, not hard, but semi soft uh, tube. And then they use McGee catheter to introduce it to the airway. And then um, they use, um, of course, you need two person to intubate and they use five to six French gauge feeding tube. And then after they take the tube, um, the, the uh, blade and the McGee forceps out, uh, if they need uh, ventilation, they can ventilate and then they start to inject surfactant. And um, it's been um, published uh, in 2007. Um, then there is another method called take care method. They use a little bit harder tube. This is from Turkey and, um, uh, and by Canmas, and they use same size. Uh, they don't use medication, but um, in, in Cologne method, they use a little bit larger volume. In take care method, they use the small volume surfactant, which is the Curacel, which is 1.25 mL per kg. And they, uh, they put the feeding tube without McGee catheter, uh, with laryngoscope, under direct vision. And this is the, uh, this is the uh, take care method. So you can see they use the feeding tube, and they insert the feeding tube on the larynx, and they put the baby on the uh, while and uh, uh, they keep injecting the material very fast. The problem with this, you can see that there is a labored breathing and also there is uh, increased incidence of uh, 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 spoiling or, or wasting some of the surfactant. In addition, when you give the feeding very fast, um, uh, you will force the surfactant. And remember, uh, when you force the surfactant by positive pressure, the surfactant will go to the already open alveoli because it goes by force. While what do you want the surfactant to go? To the closed alveoli, because that's the one. And therefore you need the baby to uh, suck it in by a negative pressure. So it should not be given fast. So I disagree with this method. It not, should not be given as fast as that, but also you should not give it as slow because it will cause hypoxia. 
Um, but you need to, the driving force of surfactant is the positive pressure or the PVV that you do. Second is the negative pressure created by baby, especially if he's spontaneously breathing. And the other force is diffusion where the surfactant goes on the wall. So in my view, the less uh, concentrated or diluted surfactant, which is the Sorvanta or Bless, is much better. I think Bless is superior to Sorvanta uh, because it's, it's diluted. It's the same example if you put a drop of water on the wall and a drop of fat on the wall. You will see that the drop of water move very fast on the wall, while the drop of the fat is slower. And exactly the same when you give higher concentration because it's fat, uh, it moves slow on the wall. So you need to force it in. While if you give it diluted a little bit, it goes by surface diffusion, and also um, it, it, the baby will try to suck it in because it will dip, it give it slow. It's a um, not con it's it's not concentrated, so the baby will suck it into the closed alveoli. But when you give fast or you give concentrated, you have to force it in, and when you force it in, it goes to the already open alveoli, and you don't need the surfactant. You don't want the surfactant to go to already open alveoli. In addition. Um, you will also uh, 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 have more spoil of, of blood. Uh, this is the Australian method, the optimist, where they use a vascular catheter under direct vision. And again, you can see that they didn't, they put the baby on CPAP while giving it, and they use the Curacerf, it's a small volume, and they're injecting it very quick. And you can see while they're injecting, the baby start to have labored breathing because they, they, they're causing mechanical obstruction. You can see the baby start to move and he's not happy uh, because they are, and they're holding the baby now. So they give the surfactant and then they take the vascular catheter out. They are done. So this is one of the minimal invasive way of Now we go come to the, our method. So when we use a vascular catheter, which is 17 gauge French. And also we use the double port CO2 detector. So we make sure you can see in Ecalmist and Optimist and Colon, they were not sure there is no way other than being trusting the operator that he's uh, catheterizing the trachea. But in our method, we use a small, very small size uh, double port uh, CO2 detector to make sure that we actually intubating the, the trachea at the end. And the other method we, we observe and this is our way of giving surfactant. We observe the, um, when we insert the vascular catheter, we use the uh, large volume uh, surfactant, um, which is the, uh, uh, like uh, the BLESS, which is the five mil per kg, not the Curacerf, which is 1.25 mil per kg. And second, we make sure that we are intubating and we give it slow and we give CPAP during and we monitor the vital sign. So here's our method. So you put the vascular catheter under uh, direct vision, and then you will observe the surfactant. You give a small bolus of surfactant, which is about 0.5 mil or less, and then you disconnect, and then you look, the column of surfactant move up and down and sometimes comes back to you to make sure that you are actually intubating you're observing the vital sign and you're giving it slow. So you give it by one mil each time and stop and then observing the, and you make sure that uh, you are, you are, your vital sign is stable. And when you end, you flush it with a, um, some fluid to make sure and always the CPAP is on. The other method of, uh, so we talked about uh, insure, which is into intubate, give surfactant and extubate and it's either closed or open, and it's, um, um, the close is either double port or using MAC catheter, or sometimes you don't need to give insure. You intubate and keep the baby ventilated. That's, that's, that's your option. But also we have minimal invasive, and there are two types, tracheal catheterization and non-tracheal catheterization. So the first one is giving the surfactant in the amniotic fluid. It's still research, it's not that. So you inject it and hoping that when the baby starts Sorry about that. Oh. 
somebody turning on his camera. I don't know, all the people are. Dr. Halek, can you please turn off your camera? Thank you. Um, so the other way is intrapharyngeal, and that's why when the head is out, you will put the surfactant in the mouth. As a hope that when babies start to breathe in, we'll take the surfactant in. And the other method is nebulization. The other part of initial care is uh, so the uh, meconium stain, and all of you may know that um, we know we, we do not do intubation anymore for babies who is um, 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 uh, having meconium unless he's not breathing. So we treat the baby with meconium stain like any other baby because we used to intubate of non-vigorous baby to suck meconium. That's not the more any case. We don't do that. No evidence for that. So we treat a baby with meconium um, whether vigorous or not vigorous, like as if there is no meconium. Um, it's very important to connect the pulse oximeter. It's very important that you turn on your pulse oximeter before connecting the baby. And um, you always need the SAT monitor when you resuscitate, when you ventilate, or there is persistent cyanosis, and you need a SAT monitor whenever you give oxygen and make sure that you select the predactal or right upper arm. And if you have pulmonary hypertension, you need a pre and post -dactyl. Uh, You should have target, so you don't do more than required. That's part of gentle care. So we expect that the, uh, at one minute, the saturation or the SAT from pulse oximeter is not more than 60%. Until we reach 10 minutes, it's around 85. So at 10 minutes, if you are 85, you don't need to give oxygen. <laughs> Now the oxygen, how you do oxygen. Now our unit in babies more than 30 weeks, we start with room air and then we give according to the need. If the baby less than 30 uh, or equal to 30 weeks, we give 30%. We start by 30% and then we, uh, when we use oxygen is always a blended oxygen. So we use air oxygen blender, medical air with air oxygen blender with oxygen to give. We don't use oxygen by flow. When you need to give positive pressure ventilation by your hand, you have to select whether you use self-inflation, flow inflation, TPs, or uh, LMA. We like to give, use the flow inflation, and the reason because we can give 100% oxygen, we can control how much pressure, and uh, um, uh, it's easily you can pick up when there is no seal. In addition, all of that, even with flow inflation, we don't use the valve at the top of the of the at the at the at the, uh, the top of the valve because we hold the uh, uh, the opening by our hand. This will give us better sense of how much pressure we are giving. And remember that when you give, you need to make sure you are positioning, you are sectioning, you have a good seal, you monitor the breathing, and have Mr. Soba on board, which is. Um, a way of if you are not ventilating well, whether it's uh, uh, your mandible or repositioning or suctioning or, or obstruction, or you need to give more pressure. So Mr. Soba, if anybody can Google it, will know what is Mr. Soba. And this is um, the Mr. Soba abbreviation, mask, uh, repositioning, suctioning, opening, pressure, and airway. Um, and now we talked about CPAP, so, but I, I just need to make sure that you guys understand you need to start within two minutes and you need to decide whether to use mask or prong. Well, prong are very important to use because the whole point of CPAP is in the prong. So you need to use the generator, not the ram cannula. Uh, the ram cannula, when you connect the baby to ram cannula or any cannula, that means the baby will breathe against the pressure from the cannula till the um, till the device that delivering the pressure, which is usually the ventilator. While when you use the prong, you will use the uh, principle of what we call it fluidic flip, where the baby when you breathe in, um, uh, uh, the, the CPAP will deliver the pressure, but when the baby breathes out, he will not breathe, he or she will not breathe again as the machine, it will breathe outside. So they call it in, out, in, out, or we call it fluidic flip. So you need to decide whether you use a variable flow, which use a prong, prong or mask, or use the ventilator with the uh, uh, ram cannula, or use the double CPAP. And what is the um, um, uh, CPAP level? And uh, now there are 
what, what I call it Sibabo phobia, people afraid of going up. Now in our unit, we go up to 15 centimeter of water of CPAP. We don't go more than that, but we use high level CPAP. But of course, it depends how confident you are and what type of machine, because not all the machine can deliver up to 15 centimeter of water of, of CPAP. And also, uh, uh, there is no link between high level CPAP and pneumothorax, but you need to make sure of that. When you intubate, you need to have a correct size, tubing, RSI. You need to have procedure on board of uh, how to assess correct intubation, your tube level, tube position, chest compression, timing, training, starting, when to give epinephrine and the doses, um, IV fluid duration and dose. We start with 65 ml per kg in time baby. And we, uh, and we start with 80 ml in Britain baby. And the next day we go to um, 80, 100, 120, until we reach 125. Um, not a must, but that's usually the standard. The reason we're selecting this, because the nurse know, the RT know, the pharmacist know. So it's kind of standard order, but does not mean that if you start 90 is wrong. But that's what we do. We start in lower fluid for uh, a term baby and a higher a little bit of TMM baby. And then we, in addition to total fluid, uh, uh, total fluid intake, we, we collect how much uh, really the baby get in second day or total fluid requirement. We should have a very clear um, guidelines about central lines, UAC, UVC, peak line, cut down surgical lines, arterial lines, and what type of fluid. We usually either use normal saline or hip saline, and we use acetate when there is acidosis. If it's a peripheral, we use heparin. If it's a central, we don't use. And it's very important to decide when to stop. Okay. And uh, when we, if you fail and why you fail. So there are a list of conditions that you will fail intubation, like uh, when you have meconium aspiration or you have meconius blockage or you have coenal atresia or you have upper airway abnormality or you have congenital malformation or you still have side effect of, of ventilation like pneumothorax or you have a fluid or you have congenital malformation like congenital diaphragmatic hernia or you have um, oligohydramnia and pulmonary hypoplasia or you have pneumonia or you have RDS. Um, it's very important that when you fail and still cyanosis to consider congenital heart disease or heart block and what is the causes of apnea? Remember, apnea and term baby is always pathological. You need to be investigated. But apnea and premature babies, it might be apnea of immaturity, and then uh, you need to consider the causes. Remember, apnea in term baby is always pathological. It's also vital to decide when to stop. Guidelines say, if there is no heart rate, it's 10 minutes from starting resuscitation. You don't need to go more on that. Um, the other things is stopping the brain, but the other things is to withhold resuscitation. In our institute, we do not resuscitate in less than 23 weeks, in babies less than 400 grams, or when there is obvious congenital malformation with 100% uh, death. However, if you are in doubt, intubate, take care, transfer to an ICU, stabilize, and then talk with the parent and healthcare providers, and then decide to to withdraw the care. Now, this withdrawal of care, depending on the state law, on religious belief, or where you're working. Um, the problem sometimes is the gray area. So you have a clear guideline of not to resuscitate, and if you have a clear guideline when to resuscitate, but sometimes there is a gray area. So where you're in doubt, remember, intubate, initiate, and transfer to an ICU. You might need to just provide comfort care or you only provide oxygen until the baby died. But you should provide oxygen. You should not allow baby to go cool. You should not allow pain. You should give good sedation and you always keep the baby with parents. Uh, after, uh, when you fail resuscitation, it's very important to discuss. Uh, we attend the funeral of the baby. We do follow up with the parent and we take care of our staff. There are different tools and device on the procedure to take care of our stuff. Very important to prevent hypoglycemia, whether using the dextrose 10 or the 12.5 or 15. 
what we find that using glucogel or oral glucose is as good as using IV. So the nurses are allowed to give bolus of glucogel 0.5 ml per kg, um, even without uh, consulting a pediatrician. And then if more than three needed, then they consult us. We might decide to give feeding on glucogel and monitor the baby, or might switch the baby to IV if there is poor feeding. But it's very important to define what is hypoglycemia. We define hypoglycemia as less than 2.7 at first three days and uh, more than less than 3.3 at after three days. And then you have to decide when to use insulin. So again, we define hypoglyce uh, hyperglycemia. Um, so hypoglycemia, first three days, hyperglycemia. Uh, hypoglycemia in first three days, we go with uh, uh, 2.7. And after three days, we go with um, more than, uh, uh, less than 3.3 hypoglycemia. And then uh, we have definition of hyperglycemia. We usually define hyperglycemia when then it's eight millimole and it's about 145 milligram per deciliter. We usually do not start insulin until the number is two digits, which means 10 and more. And we always make sure that the baby is getting at least five when he's hyperglycemic milligram per kg per minute of sugar. Very important to prevent hyper and hypothermia. And you need to decide what blood work you, you do. CBC, grouping, culture, CPR, uh, CRP, ESR. Um, you need to decide uh, about your pro, um, 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 antibiotics and um, indication of your capillary, arterial, or venous gas. And what's the indication and what's the benefit? Uh, you need to decide about the antibiotics. We give antibiotics um, if there is risk factors like white PC less than 5,000, when there is prematurity, if GBS positive and untreated, previous GBS sepsis, if there is ruptured membrane more than um, 18 hours, chorioaminitis, there is fetal distress, RDS, acidosis, hypotension. We start with ampicillin gentamicin. We only give uh, 48 hours automatic discontinuation if the blood culture is negative. It's very important to start um, the caffeine. We do caffeine based, not citrate, and we do, we do loading. So I advise that people go with low dosing and then uh, give the maintenance because that will give you more room to give another loads if the baby is not breathing. Uh, so you have to decide whether to give IV or oral and what's your gestation and when to stop. Usually we stop it at age of 35 weeks and always look at the side effect. You need well, pre resuscitation, you need to care, take care of, 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 uh, of CNS complications like apnea, seizure, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Um, you need to take care of, of, of pulmonary complications like RDS to ventilate, to give surfactant, x ray, gases, pulmonary hypertension like doing a target neonatal echo, starting nitric oxide, treatment of pneumonia, and when you have pulmonary air leak, whether it's a PIE or it's a pneumothorax. And what's your indication of high frequency? We usually start high frequency very early uh, to avoid as a lung protection strategy to avoid complications. And also one of the pulmonary complications is TTA. Usually it's a gray area, what to do, observe or admit, is sometimes difficult to decide. Uh, very important about hypotension, what type of inotrope, dopamine, dobitamine, vasopressin, epinephrine, norepinephrine, uh, volume expander, what type of volume expander, what's the dose, and when to use steroid. We do not use steroid unless it's not responding and the, the, the level is low. Very important to minimize um, um, the uh, uh, amount of, of, of blood test, but you need to monitor the electrolyte, the renal function, liver function, and coagulation profile sometime needed. We never use naloxone not any more indicated. We do not use sodium bicarb, very rarely, unless there is obvious loss in the bic in, of bicarb in the, uh, in the uh, urine. Very important to have feeding protocols, EBM, DBM, or formula. Start MEF. And for people who does not know what MEF is, MEF is a gifted feeding. It's a feeding not considered from TFI. And it's uh, usually go 20 to 20% 20 of total uh, IV fluid. And it's, um, it's meant to stimulate GIT, it's not meant for nutritional value. So MEF or minimal enteral feed is not part of the TFI, it's a gift, and it's uh, for nutritional value. And then, or you decide sometime you don't need MEF, you start protocol feed. Also what you will do with uh, alias, or if they have a bleeding, 
And the most important is in sucking and swallowing, when to start um, feeding the baby uh, by bottle. And the most difficult for the uh, resident and is residuals. Well, what do you will do with the residuals and vomiting and when the baby gets abdominal distension, whether it's um, overfeeding or it's feeding intolerance or it's uh, uh, neck and, and inflammation. And then you need to decide whether to give it bolus over 20 minutes or gavaget or you give it um, um, by, by, by gravity or you give it continuous, whether it's 30 minutes or one hour or, 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 or two hours or, or continuous all the time. You need have to have a plan about your gastric cases, omphalocele, intestinal obstruction, spina bifida, congenital heart disease, diaphragmatic hernia, or congenital airway malformation. We used to call it CECAM, but now we call it CEPAM because it's not cystic. Um, also, you have a plan for imperforated anus and complex malformation. Super important is record. Golden hour sheet or antenatal care plan. Admission notes. Central line sheet, vital sign sheet, verbal and written consent, ventilation record and gas record, physician order sheet, whether it's medical or non-medical, patient list. I know patient list is not there um, in Iraq and all Middle East and even in, 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 in Gulf states and Egypt. I went to all these places. They don't do patient list, but it's very vital. Entry part of discharge summary. So it's important to start discharge summary at admission. Hypothermia assessment sheet. Um, when I gave the talk about neonatal encephalopathy, we talked about this. And the, I showed you some of the standard order sheet and then progress notes. It's very important to have a protocol of writing notes, uh, whether it's admission notes or it's other type of notes like progress notes. Not everybody write whatever they want. There should be a guideline and, 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 uh, and a procedure we follow. Now, this is the whole initial care by video, OK? So, um, uh, but it's very long, so I'm not gonna show it to you all, but uh, I, gonna, I can upload it on the YouTube and you guys can absorb yeah. it. Unfortunately, I cannot show it all, but I would show it all, so it's, it's it's by video, start from birth, from C-section, until the baby uh, arrived to an ICU. All what I've talked about is in this video, uh, but it takes about 45 minutes, so there is no time to, uh, to present it, but I'm gonna upload it, and then you guys can watch it, can uh, download it, whatever you want to do with it. And um, I am done, and I am happy to... Uh,